Good morning, church. So glad to be here with you all today to sing, worship, and praise the Lord our God, to hear His word and be changed by the living God. Amen? Amen. So let us stand for the reading of God's word as we prepare our hearts to worship and honor Him. Colossians 1, 28, it, this, this is what it says. We proclaim Him, admonishing every man and teaching, and teaching every man with all wisdom. So that we may present every man complete in Christ. Let's pray together. Lord, we wait on your word. For your word is true and truthful. There is no error. You are living and you are breathing in our lives every single moment of our days. And we love you, Lord. And we pray this uh, scripture. We pray this text today that you may make us complete for your work, may, may, may make us like Jesus Christ every single day. Lord, our hearts are for you. Teach us to love you and to honor you with our hearts, with our minds, with everything that we are. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning. You can remain standing because you'll just be up here in just a second to worship. But uh, we're excited that you're here to worship with us today at Lane Prairie Baptist Church. I know we have a number of visitors here with us today, and we're excited that you've come to worship with us today. Uh, we'd ask in the row in front of you where you're sitting, there's a card in the seat back there. If you would fill that out for us. And then uh, across the back wall, there's some black letter boxes here. Or one of our staff that you see up here uh, through the course of our worship service today, you can give it to one of us at the conclusion of the service. But uh, that would be your gift to us today. That's all we'd ask from you this day. But uh, I, I pray today as we worship, as we go to the Word of God, that you would be blessed, that you would be challenged, and that uh, the goal is, is that when we walk out of this place, we walked out more conformed to the image of Christ than we Amen. walked in this morning. And so that's our prayer for you today. And so I just want to invite you to join us as we begin to worship this morning. Amen. What is our hope in life and death? Christ alone, Christ alone. What is our only confidence? That our souls to Him belong. Who holds our days within His hands? Who comes apart from His command? And what will keep us to the end? The love of Christ. Stand and man, church, so sing, oh, sing, hallelujah. Our hope springs eternal, oh, sing, hallelujah. Now and ever we confess Christ our hope in life and death. What truth, what truth can calm the troubled soul? God is good, God is good. Where is His grace and truth that's known? In our great Redeemer's blood, who holds our faith when fears arise? Who stands above the stormy trial? Sends the waves that bring us night unto the shore, the rock of Christ. Oh, see. To the grave, what will we sing? Christ, He lives, Christ, He lives, and what He wore will heaven bring. Everlasting life with Him, there we will rise to meet the Lord, then sin and death will be destroyed. Oh, see, hallelujah, 
I'm going to uh, go ahead and uh, share something first. I'm going to say that if I trip and fall this morning, I did it on purpose. Uh, so kind of like uh, that opening uh, part there in Willy Wonka, it's completely on purpose if I do that. But uh, no, I am thankful for that living hope that we have in Christ today. And uh, today... Uh, we had a, uh, one of our members, a great man of God that the Lord called home this week, Larry Taylor. Um, you be in prayer for BJ and Celeste and the rest of the family. They're going to be doing the service at 1 o'clock Wednesday at Mountain Valley Funeral Home. But uh, Larry had a living hope. Uh, he was confident that when he breathed his last, then he would be in the presence of God. Not because of anything he had done, but because of the sufficient work of Jesus Christ at the cross and through his resurrection. And so you be in prayer for them, be in prayer for people like Wayne Beheimer who are under hospice care, and then just even yesterday, Billy Barrow. But uh, all three of these men of God that I've uh, been able to talk to as they've gone through these things of life, and they have a hope that's laid up beyond this life. And, uh, and so as they face death, very real there in the face, they do it with hope for what comes after this life. So you remember these families, but at the same time, uh, we don't grieve as those who have no hope. Uh, we have hope beyond this life if we've put our faith in Jesus Christ. And so this morning, uh, I want to invite you to join us in the chapter 1 of Colossians as we are actually going to finally finish up chapter 1 this morning. Uh, and then, uh, but, uh, you know, as you're turning there, uh, we're going to be in starting in verse 24 and cover verses 24 through 29, uh, this morning. But, um, has anybody ever seen, uh, a, a picture or rendering somebody's done where maybe there's someone who's, uh, watching something in a TV or looking at a painting. And then when you actually look at the TV or the painting, it's the exact same picture inside that painting or picture. And then when you look in the painting inside that picture, there's another painting of the exact same painting. And, you know, it just kind of, it just draws you, draws you in. And so really, uh, what's going on, we talked about it last week, uh, what goes on here really from about verse 14 to the end of this chapter, really uh, even into uh, the first uh, few verses uh, in the first uh, four or five verses in chapter two, is that is like, it's like every time it just draws in a little closer, it draws in a little closer. And so this morning, that's what happens. Because you remember last week as we looked and we, we talked about that, that picture of reconciliation, and then he concluded it saying, because I've been reconciled, of which I've been called or, or made a minister or a servant. It's actually the Greek word we get from deacon, diakonos, that he uses right there uh, of this. And so he, he kind of ends with saying, hey, because I've been reconciled, I've been made this minister. And then so this week, it's kind of like the next picture in. He says, let me tell you about what it means for me to be this minister. And so this morning, we're going to look at this, uh, and really it, it connects back to verse 23 when Paul uh, was reconciled. It changed, remember last week we talked about how it changed the direction, it changed the trajectory of his life. He went from being a religious person to a child of God, and he went from a persecutor of the church to a builder of the church, and so it changed the direction of his life, and it, it took him from who he was to this minister, this servant of the church, and he says that in verse 23, and then verse 24, it kind of picks up and, and shows, hey, in general, this this hey, Colossians, listen, because of uh, this ministry and what it entails, um, and in turn, it, it, it's urging, um, and he's saying, look, uh, as I've said and reminded you to be faithful because Christ is sufficient and Christ is supreme, and uh, here's how my life was reconciled, and here's what I'm doing it, and because of my faithful ministry, here's another reason that you should continue to remain faithful uh, and not be drawn off course by this Colossian heresy. And so uh, that's where we're going to be going this morning as we walk through these verses. And so I'd ask if you're able to this morning, if you would stand uh, in uh, reverence and honor of the reading of God's word, I'm going to read verses 24 uh, to 29. 
It says this, now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I do uh, my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Of this church I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit, so that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God, that is, the mystery which has been hidden from past the past ages and generations but has now been manifested to his saints, to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim him, admonishing every man teaching and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ. For this purpose also I labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. Father, today, may you bless the reading of your word. Father, may uh, you do a work in this place that only you can do. Father, may you guide the words that come from my mouth today. Father, may you uh, hold any words that are about to come upon my tongue that you don't want uttered in this place and give me the words that you would have me to speak. We pray this now in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. And so as we kind of walk through uh, this passage today, and there's a lot there, and so uh, what I want to do is really is to look at what he says here. Remember, he's going to talk about what it means to be a devoted minister, a devoted servant of the Lord. Um, and so this, this called out one, this one who is serving the church and what it means and, and kind of what is that picture of the devoted uh, minister. And, uh, and I, I, I want to make sure you don't just clock out right now and go, well, we're going to talk about what it means to be a devoted minister. Shouldn't that be reserved for people in ministry? What's that got to do for us? Uh, Here's what I've discovered in a lot of this stuff, a stuff that we do and we're called to do by the Lord in the context of the local church is oftentimes stuff we as the church are supposed to be doing as well, um, but God's called us to equip, and as we're going to see here, um, to hopefully help you grow uh, so that one day you can present it to God mature, all right? And so there is things here for us. But also, at the end of the day, it's, it's going to help us as a church know, for those of us that are called to uh, the ministry, what it is that God is calling us to and, and what it is we should be doing. And uh, we'll talk about, I'm, I'm getting to my closing kind of uh, application before I ever get through the text. But I, I, just, I, I do that because I don't want you to clock out and say, well this, is, well, this is only for our interns over here. This is only applicable. No, this is, for, this is the Word of God. It's applicable for all believers. Amen? Amen. So let's look at it this morning. Uh, Three things that I see here within the text uh, that a devoted minister, a devoted servant. And the first we see in verse 24 is this, is that a devoted minister will suffer for the church. Look at what it says there in verse 24. It says, now I rejoice in my sufferings. You remember uh, way back when we started this, we made reference, kind of talking about the context of the book. Where is the Apostle Paul writing this letter from? Prison, all right? So he's, in, he's suffering there already. He's writing from prison. And so I think we get a little clue there. But he says, now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, for the Colossian church's sake. And in my flesh I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction. All right? And so um, I, I, I want to preface before we kind of uh, pull this little verse apart. There's some things in this verse that we just, we can't fully comprehend what's going on. We don't exactly know the exact, what is the suffering that he's going through, what, but we, we do know that it is a physical suffering. He says here, he says, I'm rejoicing in your suffering and in my flesh. And so we, we do know that this, and we can go through and we can look through scripture and we can see ways in which the apostle Paul uh, Suffered. He was beaten. He was stoned at Lystra. He was shipwrecked and abandoned. And uh, we can see all of these things. And it, it could be any one of these types of things. We don't know the specific thing right here that he's talking about. But we do know that he was suffering. And it was for the benefit of the Colossian church. All right. He was preaching. And because he was being faithful to the call that God had placed on his life, he suffered because of it. Think about it for a minute. Let's think about the Apostle Paul, who he was. He was 
the up and comer. In Jewish religious world at that time, in, in the religious system, like he was the rising star. He was the kid that gets started getting watched like in uh, Little League Baseball that's then watched in high school and then watched in college uh, who doesn't even go to the minor league. He was that guy. He was on that path. And so when he denounced that, that legalism and he acknowledged Jesus to be the Messiah, you better believe that persecution began to come his way. Because you remember the persecution that he was putting on the church. Like he stood as as Stephen was stoned to death. And that was the part that he was, and now he went to the other side. But he says here, to be a devoted, to be a faithful minister, you will suffer for the church. And so for those that are within our body, a part of our intern program, those that are in seminary, I want to encourage you today that suffering is part of the package. You will suffer if you're committed to the church. Because the enemy does not like what you're doing. It doesn't like you to be building up the body. It doesn't want you proclaiming the gospel. But notice, Paul isn't writing this and complaining about it. Paul is writing this and rejoicing. He says, I rejoice in my sufferings. He says, I'm taking this in my physical body and I rejoice in it. I'm happy that I get to be counted worthy to suffer. Suffering. Is a part of what it means to be the devoted minister. When you look at the latter part, um, and I made mention there's some things in there that um, that are just really tough to decipher. Decipher the latter latter part of verse 24. So 24b, it says this. He says, "I'm doing this in my uh, flesh. I do my share on behalf of His body, which is the church." And Paul says, "I'm doing this not for my own benefit. I'm doing this for the benefit of His body, His church, the church." That's what I'm doing. And it says, in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. All right? Uh, What does that mean? If if you could get uh, a bunch of people to agree on what that actually means, uh, you're doing better than me and probably a whole lot of other theologians. And so uh, you read commentary on this. Uh, I mean, there's a whole lot of people a whole lot smarter than me, and they don't agree on what this exactly means. But I I want us to look at, I'll I'll give us a couple things, but I want us to make sure we know what exactly he is not saying when he says this, which I think is the most important takeaway from this verse right here, all right? And so a lot of people take this and they look at it, and this is where works-based salvation begins to creep in a little bit. It says, hey, what am I doing, this suffering that I have? It's filling up. What is lacking in Christ's afflictions. And it almost, on the surface, when you look at it, it almost looks like he's saying that what Christ endured got us pretty close, but it didn't get us all the way there. But that's exactly what he's writing against in this entire letter. That's everything that we've talked about so far, isn't it? Everything we talked about in the hymn of Christ, starting in verse 15, what? It was the fact that Jesus was sufficient and Jesus was supreme, and we didn't need anything else besides Jesus. So I can tell you 100% what the Apostle Paul is not saying right here. is He's not saying that I had to suffer just a little bit more so that then I could be made complete in Christ. That I could be reconciled. He said, no, that was Christ and Christ alone. And so then there's a whole bunch of other things that, uh, as I said, theologians debate over this, what it could be. Um, some, some view it as in reference to the fact that as we suffer, that Christ suffers along with us. And I think there's, there's truth, then there's, there's scriptural backing for all these different things. Um, some people look at this as uh, if when you go back to Mark chapter 13, he, he talks about the birth pains, that there's going to be afflictions and there's going to be, or there's going to be more suffering that comes and has uh, he says, I, I'm just a part of these, all this other suffering that's going to come along as well. Um, and so there's a lot of different things 
right there. Um, perhaps it's the idea that Paul is saying, hey, that his suffering in a way unites him with Jesus. As Jesus suffered, Paul suffered uh, as a follower of Jesus, right? And we see throughout Scripture, right, uh, we're told that in this life you will have trouble. You will face tribulation, right? Uh, a master is not greater than his servant. If Jesus suffered, we're going to suffer as well. But again, you could get five or six theologians together and they would debate on this and probably all leave with their own opinion of what exactly that means. But really the takeaway that I want us to see from this is what it's not saying. As I said, he's not saying that the work of Jesus on the cross, that redemptive work on the cross was inadequate. That's not at all what he's saying. He's, saying, he's already told us that completely sufficient completely supreme. All right? So, first, a devoted minister will suffer for the church. The second thing, a devoted minister will share the gospel with all, with everyone. Look at verse 25 through 28. Of this church, I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit so that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word. And so what I want to do is kind of walk kind of verse by verse through this and we look at this idea that a devoted minister will share the gospel with everyone. All right, and we see verse 25, the first thing we said of this, I was made like this was, a, he's, he's understanding, remember all the way back when we started in the first two uh, uh, verses of this, Paul talked about that he had been called by God. And so here he's reiterating that, that I was made a minister. This wasn't something I got up and decided to do. It was the call of God upon my life. And of which he goes on here and says, uh, this, I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God, right? A steward, what? Is not one who represents his own interests, but the one who is over him. And so Paul's saying, hey, this, is, this ministry is a stewardship. This isn't what Paul thinks. And so uh, me as a minister at Lane Prairie Baptist Church, as I stand here, this is not what Ricky Fuchs thinks that you should do. This is my job is to say, here's what the Word of God says we should do, who we should be, what we shouldn't do. And so he says here it's a stewardship. Look at it as he continues, this stewardship that he had from God bestowed. And, and what was the purpose of it? He says, the reason I was made a minister was to benefit you, to benefit the church. God has called us for your benefit. Why? So that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. It goes on verse 26 as he continues to look at this idea that the devoted minister will share the gospel with everyone. And he goes on and he says this, that is, he just said, carry out the preaching of the word of God. And then verse 26 connects back to there. That is, he's defining what the preaching of the word of God, that word of God is, the mystery which has been hidden from past ages and generations, but now has been manifested to his saints. All right, and so he's gonna. We're gonna see this word mystery pop up a couple times, and when he does it, he actually uses it in kind of two different ways. So this first time here, as we see, he connects it back. But that mystery, when he talks about it here in verse twenty six, is referring back to the word of God. It's referring back to the gospel. All right, uh, and, and this hidden. Uh, remember, who's his audience? It's primarily a pagan, previously pagan Gentile group of believers. And so they were a part of the, uh, separate from a part of the nation of Israel. So they weren't in on part of that. But now God has called Paul as this minister to the Gentiles. And he says, now this that was hidden from you, that it was obscured from you because God was working through Israel is now expanding. It was always for everyone, but now it's, it's being broken wide open for everyone and so the gospel is going forth to all people and he goes on in verse 27 says uh, 
to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He goes on mystery, and now he's using that same kind of word, and he's talking about Paul's preaching and uh, the Gentiles' reception of it. It's that idea, as he says in here, this mystery is now Christ in you, the hope of glory. God willed to make known. It was God's desire. It wasn't Paul who decided, well, hey, now the gospel needs to go forth to the Gentiles. No, this was the will of God of which Paul was being a servant to go and do what God had called him to do. And then you go on to verse 28. Um, and this was a verse we shared this morning. And just in case you think that the gospel is for a limited amount of people or just for a select few, you have a very tough time holding on to that when you read verse 28. Look at it. It says, we proclaim him, Jesus, admonishing everyone, every man, and teaching who? Every man. With all wisdom, so that we may present who? Every man complete in Christ. Paul says, Hey, my joy, being a devoted minister, uh, he's going to call me to share the gospel with everyone, to every man, every man, every man. All right? He's like, I, I, I just want you to make sure you understand that it's for everyone. It's for everyone. It's for everyone. And so that's why, as you look at that map that's over there on the side, I went and pulled a bunch of pins today because we were behind. And all across North America there, there's a bunch of pins now that weren't there. As we have partners in ministry... In New Orleans, Boston, Massachusetts, Cincinnati, Ohio, Logan, Utah, Fort Worth, Montreal, Quebec. These are people that we're praying for, people that our, our staff have interacted with and talked with. Those that are uh, here in Fort Worth, we've sat down and we visited and we prayed with them. What can we do? That's why for VBS this week when we do our mission offering as River Point Fellowship, Michael Burr, who's the pastor there, what we're going to do for our mission offering is going to be to help them. And you look and you see a pin over there on the southern end of Madagascar. The gospel's for everyone as the Washer family are there faithfully serving the Lord. And you look over there and I don't even think I've got pins over there in Algeria in France where Massey week in and week out the gospel is going forth and people are making professions of faith. And you see pins over there from Kenya where we've sent teams over the years. The gospel is for everyone. And as a minister, part of our job is to make sure that the church is being about getting the gospel to everyone. And I'm thankful for Lane Prairie Baptist Church that has a view that's a kingdom view. That's a view that's beyond the walls of this building. That's to take the gospel to everyone. That we are building the kingdom and not just ourselves. And so a devoted minister will suffer for the church, will share the gospel for all, and then also, number three this morning, will serve to present mature believers. And as we're here this morning, and you were here maybe for Sunday school this morning, you're here in worship this morning, all of these things are what? To help you mature in your faith. Look at verse 29, or the latter part of verse 28. Uh, it says, so that we may present every man complete in Christ. And then verse 29, for this purpose. He said, here's the reason that I labor, that I strive according to his power which mightily works within me. He said, here's the reason I'm working is because one day I'm going to present these before God. And I want to present them mature. It says complete there, all right? And it's that, I, it's that Greek word teleos, and it's this idea of maturity. It's not that you're sinless, but you are mature. It's a perpetual process this side of eternity. 
Uh, it's that process we call sanctification, being conformed to the image of Jesus. He says, how are we doing that? How, how are we serving to present? Well, he goes out, and look at the ver- first part of verse 28. He says, how, how do we do that? How do ministers, how do we do that? He, say, he lays out really two things here. He says, by admonishing every man and teaching every man. And admonishing carries that idea uh, with us and for us um, that we are um, warning. What is the Apostle Paul doing as he writes this letter to the church at Colossae? He's warning them about this heresy that's creeping in. He says, I'm writing, I'm admonishing. And so part of the work that we, are, we do as ministers that uh, Brother Josh and Justin and Dr. Kearns and myself, we do. Part of what we do in going to the Word of God is to warn you. And we look at things that are being shared, uh, and they look religious, and they sound good, but maybe they're not really good. And so part of our job is to warn you and say, hey, this looks all right on the surface, but really when you look at it, it's not good. And so part of that ministry is a ministry of, of, of warning, but also of teaching or instructing, all right? What is, uh, and what are they teaching and instructing? He says, uh, with all wisdom, all right, and this is not Paul's wisdom, this is the wisdom of God, all right? Again, Paul has made it abundantly obvious that he is not doing this on his own, that it's not about him, it's about Jesus, and so this wisdom, and again, that's fighting against some of this Colossian heresy, because part of that was, hey, we gain certain amounts of knowledge, and that allows us to rise to a higher level, all right? He's saying, no, this is God's wisdom, not man's wisdom, all right? And so we see it. And really, we see here, too, we also see a connection uh, back to verse 22, as we talked about last week. Remember, part of the things that we said was, uh, is that there's going to be that presentation of which he says that uh, in verse 22. Go back and look at it. And yet now he's reconciled you in his fleshly body through death. Why? In order to present you before him, the Father, holy and blameless and beyond reproach. So now he's saying Christ is uh, presenting us before the Father, and, and I, I think that's more of a positional, like, like we are all those things now, but in the practical, and I think Paul's talking practically that he's devoted and he's serving so that practically you can be mature, that he can present you as mature before Christ, before the Father, one day before Christ seated at the right hand. So a devoted minister will serve to present mature believers. Right? We don't go through what we go through. We don't plan the things that we do. We don't spend hours in study and preparation just for us. It benefits me. Every single week as I sit down before the Word of God, I'm challenged. And God uh, does surgery in my own life before I ever stand up here. But we do that for your benefit, to warn you, to instruct you, to teach you, so that you may be complete, so that you can know what the Word of God is. But I will give us a warning on the other side. What happens a lot of times, it says, well, that's your job, so I just come sit and I receive, and then I just come back on Wednesday, or I just come back on Sunday, and I get filled back up. No, no. We as believers do this day by day as well. And the final thing that we really see here in this, I want us to see in verse 29, says, For this purpose I also, I labor, striving. And notice how Paul accomplishes this. He says, I don't do this in and of myself. It's according to his power. Paul says, I am insufficient to do this myself. Christ is sufficient. I just shared with you how sufficient Christ is. And the only way that I'm able to do this is by his power, which mightily works within me. And so our staff, the things that we do, we don't do within our power. Because if it was up to us, if it was up to me, when I had this calling in my life, you wouldn't see me standing here today. Because I pulled the Moses card and said, I'm not the good, the words talk and can't do, geez, the nope. And I'm still not great with the words. 
But he says, it's not about you. It's not about your power. It's not what you're capable of. It's what I am going to do through you, through my power. And so a devoted minister will what? Suffer for the church. Will share the gospel with all. Will serve to present mature believers. And so then the question arises, okay, that's great. What do we do with this practically? All right? And I just wrote some takeaways for us today. What what do we do with this text? Where does this intersect with our life here on June the 13th? I better know what date it is. I got to go do a wedding at 530 this afternoon. So uh, some of y'all might about 345 this afternoon text me and say, are you on your way to the wedding yet? Um, Just to make sure I don't fall asleep. Um, But uh, what do we do with this on June 13th, 2021 in Joshua, Texas? Well, what do we take away? One is this, is that there is purpose in suffering. You can't read the whole of Scripture without seeing that there's purpose in suffering. Way back when COVID was kind of at its beginning, we walked through the book of James. You don't make it past the first chapter of James to see that suffering has purpose. And I think part of it goes to what he talks about ultimately is that his, his goal and what he's doing as a minister is to present mature believers. It works to mature us. It helps to affirm with us the validity of our faith. So there's purpose in suffering. And I want to encourage you to rejoice in the midst of it. As I talked to B.J. Taylor the other day after Larry passed, we talked about that, that we don't grieve as those who have no hope, that we can rejoice even in the midst of this suffering and this hurt. Why? Because... The testimony of Larry Taylor's life is that he had put his faith in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. And that God is faithful and just to keep that which has been committed to him unto that day. There's purpose in suffering. Rejoice in that suffering. See what God is doing in the midst of that suffering. One of the other takeaways I'd see from this and take for us is this, is And then just kind of a question to ask us to kind of do a little introspection is this, is what message are we sharing? The Apostle Paul, all the way through our text, has talked about what? That it's not him. I'm preaching the word of God in verse 25. He's not preaching himself. He's not building up his own agenda. And so for us, what is the message that we share as we go throughout our day? Are we preaching exactly what he's talked about? We talked about last week is that Jesus died so that he might reconcile sinful man back to himself. Is that the message? It should be the message. What message are we sharing? One of the things that I see within this as well is this, and I've talked about it a little bit at the beginning, is this. Paul was about building the church Are we? Remember a context. This is a church that the Apostle Paul had never even been to. And so when he's talking here that he's building up the church, just like we talked about last, this is the big C. When we get to verses 1 through 5, he kind of brings it down to the Colossians and actually brings in the Laodiceans in the next, and he brings it a little more down to earth here. But Paul was about building the kingdom. It was about building the church. He was kingdom focused. He wasn't building a kingdom unto himself. And so that's what happens a lot of times as a church becomes inwardly focused. They build a kingdom unto themselves and say, look what we have built. Look what we have. Look what we've got here. Look what's inside these walls. Man, look what we've accomplished. Haven't we done a great job? And if that's the case, we've missed it completely. We're about building the kingdom of God. 
And I believe as we faithfully do that, I believe God will build up the local body that's here at Lane Prairie Baptist Church, but he won't build it up so that we can say, look what we've done. He'll build it up so he can continue to say, keep going, keep doing. That's why that map's there. I know it's there week in and week out, and you probably walk by it, and you remember when we put it up, but as it's been there, you kind of forget why it's there. But I pray every time you look over there and you see that map, you realize that we're building the kingdom throughout this world. That's our purpose. We are simply an outpost for the gospel, right? An outpost did what? It didn't do anything to serve its own purpose. It served to serve the purpose of those who had established it. And so God is the one who established the church. And so we seek to fulfill his will, not ours will. So Paul was about building the church, about building, that's the big C church, the kingdom, are we. May we never lose sight of that. And then the final takeaway that I'd say this morning is this. Is I'd just ask you, as we kind of looked at this uh, uh, picture of this devoted minister this morning, that you would understand what and why our staff, what we do, why we do it, and what we are facing. And I'd simply say, will you pray for us? Because it's a call to suffer. As we suffer, oftentimes our families suffer. And that's not a pity party. My joy is to be like Paul to say, hey, I'm going to rejoice in my suffering. That I got counted worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus. But it also helps us give us perspective about what we're doing. Like we're, we're here to share the gospel with all people. That's what we're doing. And we want you to come along with us. We're here so that we can serve to present you complete, mature in Christ. And so we want you to come along with us. So I want to ask you, pray for our staff. And understand that this is a calling that God has placed on us that we haven't picked up of our own accord. And so when we gather next week, we'll look at the next little part in which he kind of brings down, talking about his ministry, kind of to that next picture in the picture that's in the picture. And says, here, here you are, uh, Colossians, here you are, those that are at Laodicea. And so we'll look at that. And so today, as we always do, as we come to this point, when we encounter the Word of God, I believe the Word of God calls for a response, calls for us to respond to it. And so for those that are here today that have been reconciled to Christ, with Christ, by Christ, prayer and what I'd ask you today as we look at this is this is those things that we looked at, like what are we building? What kingdom are we building? This little one right here or God's kingdom? Are you going through some suffering right now? The first thing I tell you is just to begin to rejoice right there in the midst of it. Even if you don't know why you're going through it right now, just begin to rejoice right now. And what's going to happen is God will shift your focus from the suffering to him. And then that will allow him to do the work that he's going to do in your life through that suffering. He might not take it away. It might not go away immediately. But I've discovered that when my focus is where it should be, the suffering seems to diminish in comparison to who he is. How do you praise him? Well, I'd say you could back up to verse 15 through 20 and just begin to praise him for who Jesus is. Begin to remember as we talked about who Jesus is. Maybe you're here this morning. And as we've talked about these things, maybe you're here today and you are apart from Christ. You've never put your faith in Jesus. I'd simply say this. You were created for a relationship with God, but because of your sin, you've been separated from God. You say, well, you don't know me. 
How do you know I'm a sinner? Well, I don't have to know you to know you're a sinner because I know what the Word of God said. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You're a sinner. I'm a sinner. That sin separated me from God just like it separated you from God. It's created a chasm so wide between God and ourselves that there's no way that we can get back. And so then shows up Jesus, who came born of a virgin to this earth, lived a life in a complete obedience to the word of God, to the commands of God, completely holy. And then he went and died to pay the price for your sin and my sin. He died on the cross. He gave his life up. He was buried in a grave, and three days later, he was raised to life again. The Word of God tells us in Romans 10, 9, you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. So maybe you're here today and you've never confessed Jesus is Lord. We want to give you an opportunity at this invitation to do that as well. Maybe you're here today and you just need someone to pray with you. We'll be here. We'd love to pray with you. Maybe you're here and you've been visiting and God's saying, hey, this is a place that I've brought you, been visiting. And so God's saying, hey, here's where I want you to plant yourself, plant your family to be a part of what I'm doing to build the kingdom through Lane Prairie Baptist Church. How would you come and be a part of us? Just simply come down front during the invitation and say, hey, we want to be a part of Lane Prairie Baptist Church. And we'll tell you how you can do that. But whatever it is that the Spirit prompts you to do this morning, my prayer is simply this, is obedience to the Spirit. Let's pray. Father, today, I pray, Father, as your word goes forth, I pray that uh, you would be glorified in this place. Father, I pray for the one here today who's apart from you, they wouldn't leave this place apart from you without being reconciled to you through Jesus and what he did uh, in his body and his death there on the cross. The fact that we have a living hope because he was raised from the dead. Father, for the believer here today that is suffering, Father, I pray that you give them rejoicing and show them how they can rejoice in the midst of that suffering. Father, I pray that you would use that suffering to bring about maturity in their lives. Father, show them purpose for that suffering. For the one who needs to come and be a part, Father, may they do that. But, Father, obedience to your spirit is what we ask for at this time of invitation. And we pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. You may stand with us. You guys, this is uh, Brother Jordan Dixon. He went with us to Fuge Camp this last week. And after much prayer and after pretty much work with him all week and the Lord working on his heart all week, these tears are genuine in that he's been playing church for a long time. And... He has been going through some rough times, some things that have been afflicting on his heart, and he knew without a shout of a doubt that he was not saved until it was this last Wednesday. And so if you can please praise the Lord in that Jordan has accepted days ago that his Lord and Savior is Jesus Christ. Amen. Love you, brother. Love you. Yeah, most certainly. So just a quick, Brother Ricky asked me to talk a little bit about camp. Obviously, we were gone all this last week, went all the way up to Austin College, which is not in Austin like I thought it was for literally six months, but all the way up to Sherman, Texas, spent a week, and I even told parents and everything up until like a month before we left. It was quite embarrassing. But um, we took up about 21 students, uh, and I think it was around six girls from Nueva Vida, our sister church just up the road, and saw three salvations and two rededications to Christ that week. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And what's amazing is, is that uh, with the huge staff, with everybody investing into them, they didn't just have one of those camp high moments where they just got to worship and lasers and everything like that. It wasn't only about that and all the amazing worship. They had Bible studies with them. They invested into them. There was girls only classes. There was guys classes. There was events outdoors, indoors, everything else in between. And a campus pastor who told his testimony and the truth of Christ over and over and over again to these students reinvigorating them in the fact that they should be dwelling with the Lord each 
and every day, not just every Sunday and Wednesday night, but in the Lord through all things. No matter how dark, no matter how light, no matter how tall the mountain, no matter how deep the valley, that God is always with them and he is a stronghold that they can put their life and trust in. So I would love to talk to each and every single one about you, about the probably five and a half hours of stories that I have from this past week and the lost voice that I have, but I think that's a pretty good wrap in for Feud. So God bless you guys. Thank you so much for your prayers. They were definitely seen throughout that week. Amen.